Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. Thank you for staying with us. I hope you enjoyed your news updates at Shab Shab News with Jubi Care. As for now, we have Dami Odufuwa in the studio with us. Dami Hi. is going to tell us all about herself, and we are going to be looking into women in media today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am great. First of all, I am loving your hair. Thank you. You know, whenever I see <laughs> natural hairstyles that are literally done so well, it's it's like my day is Yeah, but it's a lot of work. Like, and, and I've been natural for a long time, so yeah. now the longer it gets, the less I handle it myself. I get you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So tell us all about you. Who is Dami Odufua? Okay, well, perfect. Um, I am a media pro professional. I've been working in media for almost, wow, well, almost four or five years now. Um, right now, I work for CNN as a social producer. And before that, I was the editor-in-chief of Konbini, Konbini Nigeria. Uh, Konbini is actually a French publication, but I was in charge of the Nigerian division. Nice. And then before that, I was running a site called Zikoko, which was called like Africa's BuzzFeed. Um, and that was all about viral listicles and viral content. And before that, I used to work for MTV Sugar on the show okay. MTV Sugar. And that's kind of where I got my start in media, really. Amazing, yeah. amazing. So how has it been going through the different stages and processes? Because whenever we all come into media, we automatically think that we know everything. But yeah. then we learn so much along the way that we're like, oh, wow, this is a lot more than I thought it would be. Yeah, so my I actually studied economics and economics and development. I was planning to work at the UN and World Bank, and then I started working consulting, and I was bored. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, but then I, I'm really passionate about music and online media. Uh, so my first foray into media was actually in the music industry. I worked, nice. I interned at Universal Music for a few months before working at MTV in, in London. And when I got into MTV, I didn't actually have any plans of working in social media, online media per se, but then working on the show and, and working on their social media, I really fell in love with it and I felt like this is how we can tell African stories in a way that's not boring. And I felt like what I wanted to do with the UN was basically tell African stories, make sure that Africa was getting the spotlight it needed. And then I realized you could do it with entertainment. So that got me into MTV and then I decided, okay, online media is the next place because at the time mm -hmm. blogging was pretty big and that kind of got me into that. That's yeah. amazing. That's honestly amazing. Now. As with most things, <laughs> there are the positives and yeah. the negatives. Where would you say African media is today in terms of us being competitive on the global market and in terms of us looking to other places and other media houses around the world? Mm -hmm. Where is African media today? Um, right now, I think we're still developing. I know we have established um, brands, established newspapers, and a lot of the established brands are, again, uh, more, more print than mm -hmm. digital. And I think digital has only been, what, 10, 15 years max that we've really had any yeah. impact. And even then, it's still developing. And the reason why I say that is I have a big issue with the quality that we put out in media, especially online media, and a lot of... Um, I find that, especially in Nigeria, there's not a lot of verification of stories or just getting your facts right, like the person's name or their age or their picture. Things like that are very frustrating. Um, but I think that we have great stories that we can tell. So there's a lot that we can do. And right now, you know, there are a few up and coming publications, mainly run by young people like me, that I find pretty cool. Yeah. And so I think that those publications are going to be the future Amazing. Uh, of African media. Amazing. And to be honest with you, we are growing. Yeah. You know, there is, there is an obvious change going on. And it's yeah. great to have people like you at the forefront Thank of you. that. Great. Now, let's move over from African media to women in yeah. media. What would you say are the main challenges that women in media face today? Um, globally or, or in Africa? We can do both. So let's, let's start both. globally and move um, on to Africa. I think glo so in many ways they're the same. I think that a lot of us, all of us working in media, whether it's TV, print, online, we do deal with sexism. And that sexism is in most industries where, you know, when you're trying to get to the top and you're with women, what I notice and I always say is that, you know, men uh, apply for positions that they're not qualified for. Women are, wait till they think they're qualified and then apply. Then you have situations where men are getting to the top quicker and the women, you know, who are on average tend to be more, more ca capable to me, are not getting there. And when I think of media companies around the world, they're still mainly run by men. You have a lot of editors that are, are female when you think of publications like Vogue or uh, Refinery29 or um, even Teen Vogue, which is one of my favorites. Um, they were run by women, but that's because they're focused on women. So it's always nice to have a woman, woman's face. When you think of the board, when you think of you know, people making, making the shots and calling the shots, they're men. Um, so I think that there needs to be a change in that as well. And I think that the only way we can do that is as we already are, you know, women helping women, speaking out about issues, even when we think about like the Me Too movement yeah. and how that's impacted even media. We've seen like, you know, women in media complaining about their bosses, you know, complaining about, you know, their superiors. And that's a big problem. Um, in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole, I think it's still there because, you know, our society is very patriarchal and it's very much like women are home builders and homemakers. So, you know, it's still the same problem. Um, and I find that 
again, even here, the publications that are run by women are women focused, you know, so for me working on with Combini and then being a woman as editor in chief, I was really proud of that because it was, our content was a mix, it was pop culture, it was men and women, even though I felt because being a woman, I made sure that, you know, the stories we were telling were quite well rounded. Um, but I think there needs to be more people like me at my age, you know, this age group, yeah. millennials in media that are women. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Now, one main issue that we face today, not only as women, but in terms of African media as a whole and world media, is the notion of fake news. Yeah. And this is something that we always try and kill. Very recently, we had it here in Nigeria with the story of the uh, Director General and the DSS yes, going and yes. recovering 21 billion naira cash, etc. Mm -hmm. And it all turned out not to be true, you know? So, first of all, how do people determine the difference between fake news and real news? Is it dependence on the source? Yes, pretty much. Um, I think that the reason why there are some publications that are respected is because, you know, they've built a reputation over time. Um, and that's, like I said, in terms of quality, that's one of the issues, you know, quality of reporting. Um, a lot of New Age publications, even though I am one of the people in New Age, I have to say this, is that there's everybody's in a rush to get the story out quickly. So there's little effort taken to, okay, let's call the source, let's speak to the police. And what I've realized, actually, in the last few months is that people are actually willing, willing to speak to you. You know, if you try and reach out to somebody, a commissioner or um, just somebody in an NGO, whatever, yeah. who can verify your story, it's actually possible to do that. So everybody's in a rush to just get stuff out and get page views and it's quite clickbait. Um, so that's very, very, very frustrating. And I think that what needs to be done, because really it's not the, it's not the consumer's place to always mm. know. And, you know, sometimes you go to sites that are good and you're hoping that you're going to get good content. It's up to journalists and and people and editors to make sure that they're getting those stories correct, basically. Okay, so what makes a good story? I'm sure we have viewers out there who are dying to get into media, want yeah. to start writing, print, press, etc. What makes a good story? Uh, for me, the first thing I always say is find your voice. Um, there, are various, there are various publications out there, and I think that everybody can find their niche. I think you can even report on the same story, but in a different way and find an angle. So if you are a young publication, then case talk about it in a way that your demographic will understand. If you're for older people, you know, the ways that you speak, you're targeting women or different sexual orientations, whatever it is, there are ways to approach that. So a good story is basically knowing your voice and knowing what you're trying to say, and then also doing the research, like we discussed. Like, you know, there are loads of reports out there on things that, with the internet. The internet has basically made it so easy for us to get information. Like, it's literally a click of a button. Just take a few more seconds to find this out. You know, okay, contact this person, find their profile on social media, then you can actually even easily find their age or where they grew up. You know, things are easier to find. So it's, you know, get, making sure that you have a unique voice, finding your voice, definitely doing the research, um, and also just understanding your audience. So a lot of young people love very visual posts. They don't, we don't like reading a lot. We don't want to read, like, you yeah. know, 500 page articles. So, you know, being concise, straight to the point, and then, you know, working on your visuals, clear images. The biggest problem for me is people who... That, it, it does my yeah, head yeah. in. <laughs> I hate when I see, yeah. like, an article with a really badly, you know, really blurry image, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that needs to improve. As well. Absolutely, absolutely. One thing that we find in Nigeria, Dami, is that a lot of people say that when it comes to things like for example, the Mr. Blankson story mm -hmm. and how he saved 13 people. A lot of people say that why is it always international media companies to pick up on this first before our Nigerian media houses do it? A lot of people think that our Nigerian media houses are very politicized and very centered solely around politics. Do you think that this is actually true in the case? I think it's a bit of both. I mm. think with that story, for example, I, local press picked it up first. Mm. The thing is, like for me, I'm based in Lagos, and mm. that story happened in Port Harcourt. Mm. And a lot of times, most global big publications, we are based in the bigger cities. Not that Port Harcourt isn't a big city, but it was even outside Port Harcourt. So yeah. local press is most likely going to pick it up first. Um, but the problem is, people probably are following the local press. So it's until somebody really big covers it that they notice. Um, so that on one hand, I don't. I think that local press is covering the local stories, the little stories like that that become big. But I do definitely think that there is a bit of politics to, at play. Um, and I think it's Nigerian. I don't necessarily think it's just media. I think that there's a lot of censorship of voices. There's a lot of censorship of what you can say, who you can be. Um, a lot of people blame it on tradition. A lot of people blame it on culture. So you always have to consider everybody else's opinion before you can actually really be yourself. And as a journalist, that's very frustrating because your whole point is to tell the truth regardless yeah. of how people feel about it. Um, but I think also, you know, bigger publications tend to have, you know, the people that can report the stories and go a bit more in depth. Um, but I think that we only really care about stories when bigger people take it. Mm. That's actually the problem, because I think that, you know, I don't want to mention any particular names, but I think local publications, I've seen them cover stories, and then mm. until somebody really big picks it up, does it get the traction that um, it deserves?
Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now I'm going to switch it over because okay. we've had a very extensive discussion now on media. And I want to ask you about Nigeria and everything that's currently going on. And um, there's so much to speak about. I can start with the space of killings. I can start <laughs> with everything going on in the policy. Yeah. But I think I'm going to start with NSARS. Yeah. Now, we carried this campaign out on social media yeah. wildly, Dami. Everybody was there. Yeah. Hashtag NSARS, NSARS, NSARS. The media was picking up on it. And yesterday we got a response from the yeah. acting president. Is this to say that when we actually pressurize, we get the answers that we want to get? I think it, or is it the power of the media? I think it's I think it's well the people are the media now social mm -hmm. media is basically so, like society yeah. you know adding their voice and what happens to social media is basically society ads creates mm -hmm. a trend and the bigger publications the bigger media pick it up and yeah. then it goes global and international but it really always starts with the people talking and saying what they really feel um in an ideal country that always works usually mm -hmm. When people protest, they get results quite easily. And to be honest, we've been talking about SARS for a really long time. So as much as this response is great, I personally feel like it could have come earlier, yeah. if I'm being very honest. Um, and I think that we can continue to push and continue to talk. And I think the more we talk, the more change we will see. And there's something you said earlier about infiltrating that system. You know, as we talk, we also need to infiltrate the system. Yeah. And that's, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street, you know. It's not just, okay, we're committing our stuff in social. Social is very, very important, but also we need to make sure we're involved in policy making. There we yeah. go. I kind of said it better myself. Yeah. Dami, this has been amazing. Thank How you. can people contact you, though, for more um, So I am on Instagram at at Dami or Dufour. You can find me on Instagram and you can find me on Twitter at Dami underscore Dufour. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.